This is Conversations, a weekly financial podcast featuring interviews with leading investment strategists, noted technical analysts, and other key thought leaders. Brought to you by the Market Technicians Association. This is Conversations, the official MTA podcast series, and today's guest is Dr. Tom Ressler. Ressler asks, in today's world financial crisis, what imprints caused dogmatic thinking regarding the two competing economic theories, the John Maynard Keynes government intervention when needed theory and the Milton Friedman's free market theory? We believe it is not whether either theory is correct or incorrect, rather it is the dogmatic adherence to one or the other that precludes consilient thinking. Dr. Ressler has more than 34 years at the University of St. Thomas and was one of the first tenured faculty members in, was, in what was then named the Graduate School of Management. Ressler's teaching philosophy is unique in that he takes a broader view of the mechanics of statistics and how it enables value-based decision making. He has been recognized for excellence in teaching by the University of St. Thomas, University of Minnesota, and the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Ressler earned a BS in Mechanical Engineering, an MS in Industrial Engineering, and a PhD in Operations Research from the University of Minnesota. Welcome to the program, Dr. Ressler. Glad, glad to be with you. Is it all right if I call you Tom? Absolutely. No one ever calls me doctor. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, your big push is that people don't know how to properly think. What does that mean, and how, how do I currently think versus how I am supposed to think? One of my opening comments in class always is that I say to students, and you do very little to no thinking at work. And before they take me out and stake me out on a, uh, some kind of a rack, you know, I say, I'm not thinking now. The University of St. Thomas hired me to teach. They hired me to do. And so I've done teaching for many years. There are little tapes that go on in my mind. And uh, what the psychologists call this is automatic thinking. And with automatic thinking, we're more in what we would call survival mode. And a phrase that I use frequently in class is two phrases. One is, uh, instinct will overwhelm emotion. And we know that deep within our brain, we have uh, kind of the original part of the brain. I won't get into technical terms, but uh, certain things happen, and that part of the brain will take over and dominate. So I think we all have a survival drive. We want to survive at the place that we're at work. The other thing is that uh, passions trump reasoning. And this would be an area that uh, I think as we go through the little discussion today uh, would be one of the big aspects that I think people have to understand is that there's a tremendous push in uh, different areas. You know, uh, to call it just marketing would not be correct, but we look at politics, we look at products that are advertised and so forth, and it's clear that what they're shooting for is for uh, our passions, our emotions to take over, and rather than logically thinking about something, uh, we go with our passions. And so different people who uh, study this, they talk about uh, moving into uh, what would be called controlled thinking. And so uh, that's one of the aspects that uh, um, I... Uh, work with, and uh, kind of anticipating, I, we had talked a little before, that uh, the studies indicate that we are not nearly as rational a thinker as we believe we are. And right. What do, you, the, what do you mean by that? What is, what is a, why aren't people rational thinkers? What support do you have for, for saying that? And then how does it manifest itself in, in business and the markets? Well, when I was a grad student, which was way back in the 70s, uh, two individuals, Kahneman and Tversky, began doing research. They were psychologists. And the primary 
research dealt with the tremendous impact that wording had on our ability to think rationally. And one of the examples was uh, a question that said, uh, you have to make a decision on whether you're going to be treated with uh, a surgery or a, a drug. And they would they pose the problem and said, if you have surgery, 30% of the people will be dead after a certain period of time. They pose this problem to people. People make the decision. They come back exactly the same problem. But what they then say is, instead of saying 30% of the people will be dead, they say that 70% of the people will be alive. And whether it was an MD, whether it was a patient, whether it was a general public, there was a tremendous switch in uh, the decisions that were that was made. And so instead of, I don't remember the exact values, but instead of 80% picking uh, the drug, it dropped to 40%. And uh, Kahneman, Tversky unfortunately passed away, but Kahneman in 2007 got the Nobel Pri uh, Prize in Economics for this work. And what the work did was it attacked the, uh, sent one of the real major breakthroughs in economics, and that was game theory. Uh, Oscar Morgenstern and John von Neumann uh, had created this. And uh, one of the realities was that they assumed that uh, the two people playing the game you know, this would be an economic game. It could be other types of decision making, but it's tied to economics. But the two players were rational. And what Kahneman and Tversky's research and the other research that they spawned indicated that was far from being the uh, case, that a tremendous amount of irrationality. So there is a book that's now in its third printing. It's called Rational Choice in an Uncertain World. It's written by a gentleman, uh, now it's uh, Reed Hasty and uh, Robin Dawes. Dawes was a colleague of uh, Kahneman and Tversky. And uh, so he summarized uh, in the first six chapters the tremendous research that shows how irrational we are, that by using a certain word, we can go off and we, we struggle. The other thing that was started to surface was that in education we do a very poor job of teaching probabilistic thinking, uh, which leads us into how do we intelligently look at risk analysis. And I think if we look at the 2007 uh, financial collapse that we had, one of the huge criticisms of the people uh, in the area, the finance areas that led to this was their apparent complete uh, lack of understanding of how intertwined many of these decisions were and the tremendous risk we were at. Um, you know, personal note, I hope it was lack of uh, risk analysis rather than just a, a total disregard for ethical decisions. <laughs> they did understand this, but they just chose to become incredibly wealthy. When you think of rational occupations, um, scientists and lawyers come to mind. It, are are they the same? Are they different? Is there one that we should think like? Well, I, that's a great question, and uh, it's something that I've struggled with. And uh, again, the research is, is leading us into uh, more and more understanding of how the brain works. And there was something that's called a functional MRI that uh, was developed and became uh, began being used in 1999 for practical purposes. And it allows the neuroscientists, the psychologists, to have a much greater understanding of how the brain uh, works and what part of the brain is activated. And one of the things that early reach research is showing is that the emotional side and the logical side of the brain are much more closely connected than was originally thought. So I, at this point, I think they're in this 
realm of saying, you know, we have to come up with new theories. We're, we're, we're nearing a, a point that there's a, uh, a paradigm shift in terms of how we think. Now, the Kahneman and Tversky research uh, spawned a tremendous amount of research that identified cognitive biases. And one of the concerns that I have is that Kahneman and Tversky's research was over 20 years ago, uh, and yet we don't see this in mainstream uh, teaching. We don't have uh, people pointing out, well, there are anchoring issues, there are all kinds of, we could come up with technical terms, but in a short time I won't, but the, a long list of biases that um, we all have. And that's one of the things that I stress with people is that when I read this research, it just humbled the heck out of me because I knew I was falling into making those types of mistakes. And I believe that this is one of the things that uh, a lot of people have understood is the research. And um, if you look at Malcolm, uh, what's Malcolm's last thing, tipping point, but uh, he, to me, was one of those that early in the game uh, understood what much of this research was saying in terms of how the mind thinks. Now, when we look at a scientist, the scientist likes to believe that um, their entire goal is seeking the truth. But, and I think as we teach in school, this is the idea. We want you to be deductive, use deductive reasoning. This is how the mathematician uh, thinks. We want to use inductive reasoning. This is how the scientist and the statistician thinks. And we want to think this way. And we teach people with the idea that this is what's going to happen. But what the research is showing is that we don't think like scientists. And there's a fellow named Jonathan Haidt, who's a psychologist out of the University of Virginia, who I believe um, coined the phrase motivated reasoning. I'm, I'm not sure. I keep trying to find out who used this phrase first. I love the phrase because it's a new concept that's coming out saying that what's really happening out there is there's far more motivated reasoning rather than rational reasoning. And what this looks at is the idea of why is there so much controversy over something like global warming? Uh, why is there controversy still over whether vaccines cause autism or not? And we have uh, the phrase that we're seeing more denialism. It's not skepticism. Skepticism is a, a good trait. You know, you're, you uh, question things, but then when facts are presented, you look at it and uh, you're able to say, my skepticism has been reduced. Denialists are people that will just disregard. This is the ultimate to me of dogmatic thinking. They disregard any facts and they just come back and what I believe is truth. Uh, one of the things that drives me crazy is the number of people that say no compromise. We will not compromise on this. Well, that to me is the ultimate arrogance that's out there. And I believe that our society has lost the ability to do uh, civil discourse. And the motivated reasoning, uh, heat indicates that in reality, most of us think like lawyers. Our goal is not to find the truth, but our goal is to win the game. And hmm. I add to this, and I say it's to win the game, the different games of power, pleasure, and profit. And so I encourage people when they are dealing with people in some type of a negotiation or confrontation, debate, however you want to do it, whether it's uh, some interaction where one group is trying to persuade the other, the question how much motivated reasoning is going on here. And I stress we all have motivated reasoning. We are all human. Uh, I enjoy making money. I enjoy pleasure. Uh, I played a lot of athletics. So in a sense, that was power. I enjoyed beating the other team. So it's this issue of finding this balance. And a concern that I have is that the uh, drive to win all these games is uh, leading to more and more unethical behavior. 
and eventually a society cannot continue to uh, to stand or progress if we uh, don't bring rein in some of this you know motivated reasoning. Hmm. Well, the time we have left, I, I want to pull it back to the markets. And the bottom line is that people move the markets, whether they're illogical or they are logical. They still move the markets. How do you see? stronger thinkers and even correct thinkers having an edge in the markets? No, I think that the, the thing that is lacking in so many areas uh, in decision making is that uh, there's too much tactical thinking. And that is uh, we're off in the doing mode. And uh, Edwards Deming, who is was the father of the quality movement and was someone who I had great respect for and I studied. I wish we would study him more. Looked at, and one of the concerns that he had with American business, he had five deadly diseases of American management, eventually expanded that to seven. But one of the diseases was worship of the quarterly dividend. And uh, you can go online, YouTube, uh, look for Deming, and you'll watch this, and my students today still will say, I can't believe these messages are you know, 40 years old and they're so pertinent. And what he dislikes about the worship of the court of the dividend primarily is the short-term thinking, and it's to win the game. Wall Street, for some reason, has fallen completely in love with the quarterly dividend. Now, the quarterly dividend, if you come in five cents under what you projected, suddenly you can see the value of companies drop by 20, 25% just because they didn't meet this. And what that does is that it takes away strategic thinking. People don't look into the future. They don't question what what is needed. Now, I think we look at this aspect of uh, the short-term thinking, and what we uh, have to kind of recognize is that if we don't understand what technology is doing to us, uh, we're going to have a lot of trouble. And we need people that are able to go off, and it's not a phrase that I came up with, but we have to understand the second order effects of the first order victories in science and technology. A quick example of that is we have the cell phone. The cell phone is a, a phenomenal device. Uh, that would lead us to a whole other discussion in terms of big data and social media, et cetera. But what is one of the unanticipated uh, effects of the cell phone? Well, I think it's now viewed as the leading cause of death on, uh, in cars. Hmm. And so as we look at uh, one of the things that I encourage people is I say, when I was a grad student, uh, Sears, General Motors, and IBM were the flagships of the American economy. Forty years later, these are not the flagships of the American economy. And a big part of this is that in organizations, we have to see how the uh, economy is going to be affected. And to me, the area that uh, I believe that people that you know are listening to us that they have to consider is this aspect of um, paradigm shifts were made. Let's say if we look at Sears, two companies that understood what technology was going to do were uh, Target and Walmart. Now, Target is out of Minnesota, so I had friends that were working for Target. They, I had a friend that would come in and he said, "This is amazing." Every week we run 20 miles of cash register tape so we can get data. Now the game has totally changed, but in a sense that was one of the first examples of big data. Mm -hmm. and they recognized that the retailing business in terms of stocking and inventories, etc., was going to totally change. And Walmart did the same. They, they changed the game of logistics, etc. The new game that's out there now, uh, you know, Amazon, Google, and others are coming up with 
tremendous algorithms that allow them to go back and to um, all analyze the big data. And I think that too many companies don't recognize that uh, there's a different type of intelligence that's being developed. And uh, I have a magazine or journal that I really enjoy a lot. It's called New Scientist. It's out of England. And they had an article that called, uh, let me just give you the title, It's Higher State of Mind. We have created a completely new form of intelligence, although no human can understand it. And what <laughs> is changing here is that, um, let me uh, read this. Uh, they make a distinction, and it's a little article. It's uh, dated August 10th, 2013, so it's, it's fairly recent. In the early days of artificial intelligence, explainability was prized. When a machine made a choice, a human could trace why. In other words, the human could understand why this decision was being made. Yet the reasoning made by data-driven artificial intelligence today, this is the big data, is a massively complex statistical analysis of an immense number of data points. It means we have traded why for simply what. And so it's a very nice little article that I think captures a paradigm shift that's occurring that too many people don't understand. Hmm. And that is that the machine, he talks about uh, machine learning, that the machine is going to go back, it will make decisions. And in the Robin Dawes book that I um, mentioned, he quotes a researcher that claims that there has never been a, uh, you know, a, a research run study where the human expert has defeated the computer model in decision making. And he looks at two examples or gives two examples. One would be uh, experts who do heart surgery. They are given information about uh, people that are going to have heart surgery and asked to predict who will live or die, uh, will be alive 30 days from now. This is a model developed out of Carnegie Mellon. It was about 80-20 or 80-70. The machine was right 80% of the time. The heart surgeons right 70%. They do the same thing in looking at uh, who will pay back a loan. So they go to experts in the area of uh, giving, presenting loans, and uh, they give the computer and the loan officers the same questions, and again, it came out to be 80-70. Hmm. And Bill Gates had an article that probably is five years old where this was one of the issues that he looked at, and that was what is the future going to bring in the computer? And he says, well, now we're after knowledge. We went after information. Information uh, took off in 1995 because that's what the Internet is about. But now we're looking at the knowledge. And I don't think enough people understand that uh, just as the human laborer's job was totally re revolutionized, many people were put out of work. I don't think enough people who are in college now or out working now uh, understand how some of the jobs are going to be totally obsolete. And uh, I mean, think about uh, Google out there. I mean, here's Google. Now, what does Google have to do with? They've got a car that's been uh, driven for 400,000 miles. It's a driverless car. They are taking a lot of the knowledge that they have in terms of making decisions and turning it in other directions. Just as we built bigger steam shovels, we built better equipment to change the uh, manual labor. The same is happening to the knowledge base uh, person. And uh, we have to do a better job in, in college of getting people to be better thinkers and not doers, because the doing type work 
the computer is going to continue to obsolete us. Great. That's fascinating. Well, uh, Tom, our time is long gone. Um, <laughs> sure it is. <laughs> is there anything Sorry, you I ran over? <laughs> no, this is fascinating. Is there anything you'd like to add before we go? Well, one of my favorite books, and it's an old book uh, by a fellow named E.O. Wilson, who was rather controversial. He's a Harvard uh, biologist. He created what was called social biology, which has morphed into evolutionary psychology. But uh, some of the best, the first three chapters I thought were some of the best material I've ever read. And kind of encapsulating the book was called uh, Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge. And I kind of smile because uh, Bill Gates uses the word consilience. Now, I had never used, I had no idea what the word meant. But it is an old word that came out in the 1830s. And a gentleman named Ewell, who actually coined the term scientist, up until that time it was called natural philosopher, wrote a book on consilience of inductive reasoning. And the word consilience means a jumping together. And what uh, a theme that I try to bring into my class is uh, it comes from uh, um, E.O. Wilson's message. He says, for us to solve the complex challenges of today, what we have to have is a consilience of, a jumping together of our scientific knowledge and our humanitarian knowledge. We can't go through this world being driven simply by profit. If that's uh, all there is to life, uh, there isn't much to life. Hmm. At least that's an opinion I have. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Tom. Thank you for having me. Today's guest has been Dr. Tom Ressler, and that concludes today's MTA podcast from LexingtonCapitalLLC.com. I'm Lance McDonald, together with recording engineer Shane Squarek at the MTA, reminding you that price is always right.